How would you like to make an impact in your community? How would you like to help someone that you know who's been a victim of some type of trauma? Well, maybe it's domestic violence or something a little bit more traumatic. Retired police officer and domestic violence expert Rebecca L. Mahan created a program that has been so successful that lives have dramatically changed and people have been able to overcome significant trauma. The book, Victims Overcoming Traumatic Events, is available on Amazon and is designed for patrol officers and those who respond first to domestic violence. That includes you. You might be responding to a friend or a family member that's had to, well, face a very challenging situation that has been very traumatic for them. Domestic violence or otherwise, the focus of the book really gives details that can be applied to any type of calls for service. And those who are patrol officers, nurses, and family or friends can really utilize the tools and resources that are provided inside to make a difference. There's even a chapter how you can change unhealthy things going on in your life to make them healthy and move forward. Take a few minutes to head over on Amazon.com, Victims Overcoming Traumatic Events by Rebecca L. Mahan. Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Revely. What a show today for you. If you haven't tuned in for a while, you are going to be delighted with our guest, Marco Vendego, who's a retired engineer with a creative flair. <laughs> and he is originally from North Coast of England. And his story is just going to delight your heart. From a young age, he had a passion for drawing and portrait art. His, his skills really carried him into a career during a time when hand-drawn illustrations were pretty much essential. And although the rise of computer-aided or CAD design posed challenges, he embraced these new outlets with greeting card design and language studies. It's really exciting too because his spiritual journey began in 1980 with Bible studies and it led to his baptism as Jehovah's Witness in 1982. Marco's creative spirit has just extended into songwriting and oh, wait till you hear them. And it resulted in a 2017 radio interview on RTE in Ireland after submitting a song to the Irish Eurovision Song Contest. You're going to just love it because I'm going to play some of these songs, not, not just during this show, but in some of our outcomings. But he was inspired by these adventure, these ventures, and he authored a four-part series, four-part book series, um, called The Big Bad Wolf. And it is on Amazon KDB. His audio works feature original music. Like I said, you are just going to love them. And they have a a really sort of a unique twist to the timeless story of the big bad wolf, that narrative. So welcome to the show, Marco. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Lovely to meet you again. I am so delighted. You have so much to share and I really want to get to the storyline, the narrative, how that all came about. I mean, there's so much, I'm, I'm just jazzed with all of it, but I've got to ask you about your red hat. Ah, funny you should say that. Um, I got this off a, a big issue seller. In the UK, we have people who uh, sell a magazine called The Big Issue, and that's to raise pe money for homeless people. Now, because we've got a number of Romanians in the country, uh, near where I live, or close to where I live, the big issue seller is a Romanian. And uh, I developed the friendship with him. Real nice guy. And um, anyway, I've studied Romanian, and that leads me onto a story because I only know a little bit. But uh, prior to that, I'd actually studied a little bit of Romanian about 30 years ago because where I lived on Teesside, there's a, there used to be a, an international folk festival, 
and the delegates used to come from all over the world to dance and sing at Billingham on Teesside. And um, what used to happen was that because they came from delegates came from all over the world, they would need accommodation. Well, that, and what happened? Uh, various towns would give accommodation to a country, you know, uh, from a, delegates from a, one country. And so in the local uh, free paper, they wanted uh, accommodation for some Romanians. And so I opened my house to uh, give accommodations to two Romanian, Romanian coach drivers. So this one evening after work, or one afternoon after work, I went to my local library to get a book on Romanian out. So whilst I was there, over the road, the car park, I saw the uh, coach pull in, and I knew it was one of the drivers, one of the Romanian drivers. So I went across to him. I got on the coach, and we greeted each other. And I thought, I'll do your meal tonight. Well, the new peste was fish. And in, in the UK, fish and chips is a national dish. But I didn't know what chips was in Romanian. And he, he refused the uh, fish. So I said, OK. And I thought I'll do a ham salad, yeah. So, That's yeah. So I knew what salad was, salata, but ham I didn't know. So I, I went <laughs> right, big. <laughs> <laughs> and they said kine, and I thought kine. I thought That's a dog. I said this isn't Springfield, Ohio. We don't eat dogs and cats here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyway, um, he said to me in Romanian, you're a nice man. And I returned the co compliment, but it didn't turn out that way because I called him a thief. Because <laughs> by, by his reaction, he got hold of a Bible on the dashboard of the coach. And he said, Juan, Abraham, Biblia, Biblia. I thought, oh, and he's doing this with his face. It was a dark-skinned people in Romania who were more likely to be thieves. So... That was my uh, baptism of fire with Romanian. Well, you really enjoy helping other people and your heart is just incredible. What a story. I love your Thank hat. You. It brings you a lot of really good memories and knowing for anybody to open their house, especially uh, to people they don't know, but people from another culture or another language. I mean, that, that's a lot. Mm, thank you very much. I mean, a lot of people would do it and and, and have done, you know. But uh, I had the opportunity, and it turns out the two coach drivers were nice guys. So, yeah, it was lovely. I, 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 I didn't do my ham salad. No ham <laughs> salad? No, no ham salad or dog salad. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So tell me how you got to writing. The uh, um I have a lot of ideas and uh I was inspired by a film that you'll be familiar with, Rebecca, called My Cousin Vinny with oh, Joe Pesci. Funny. This is gonna and, be so good. Yeah, and uh Fred Gwynn, Herman Munster. So I loved the film, how it was developed, and I loved the in interaction between Joe Pesci and Fred mm -hmm. Gwynn. So I thought to myself, I thought, what would happen if the big bad wolf went to court for his crimes? And so that started me down the road to uh, write something about it. And what I did, I used certain stories from folklore um, about Red Riding Hood, and uh, the three little pigs. But then what I did, I introduced two other uh, stories that were unrelated. I used Bo Peep, uh, Losing Her Sheep. And I also used a thing from childhood. We, there was a game that kids used to play uh, called What Time Is It, Mr. Wolf? Okay. And what, what used to happen, the boy would go against the wall, put his arm hands over his eyes, and the girls would go behind and say, what time is it, Mr. Wolf? And so he'd turn around and say, two o'clock. And he'd turn his face back to the wall, he'd 
creep closer and say, what time is it, Mr. Wolf? It's three o'clock. When they got to five o'clock, he said, it's dinner time. And it chased <laughs> after the girls, yeah? So uh, I've incorporated that in the story. And uh, I've used a, a lot of a, a license there. Cause, because um, you'll have been many places, Rebecca, where you've seen clocks. I, mean, I don't know if it's in Grand Central Station or whatever. There's clocks showing different time zones. And so I've yeah. incorporated that in my book. Uh, a bit of a license there, so... Yeah, and what, what happened was, originally, I was just going to do the book for myself, my own, uh, yeah, as a record of what I've done. So I went onto a, a particular site, excuse me, please, and I went, I did a, an illustration for the front cover, like Michael Jackson-esque, and I've got on Who's Bad, you know. Um, so... I did that, and I managed to finish the front cover, and I put that up on this site. But then I needed to put the uh, script on. hadn't really written much. So because I was working at the time, in and out of work, it took me about four years to really get serious about it. And when I looked, I'd had about 800 views on my on this site. I thought, wow, this has got mileage. So I thought, well, I'll try and sell it. But this particular site wanted too much money for printing costs. It would cost me money. Uh -huh. I, went on an, I went on another site. It was the same thing. So finally, I went on KDP, uh, Amazon, self-publish. And uh, that's a better site for me anyway. And the... Printing costs are still high, but the Kindle version is more akin to what it should be price-wise. Yes, I, I can understand all about self-publishing. I went that route myself. There was so much going on when I published my book that um, it wasn't about for me how many how much in royalties that I can get. It was how can I get this book out there as soon as possible because it needs to be in the hands of people. And during that time, I think there was a shift in how the digital age, just like you are very well aware of, how different <laughs> it came. It used to be that you needed to go through submitting your manuscript, be expect under the expectation that you're going to get so many rejections before you're going to have a major publisher pick you up. Then they're going to send you, you know, this advance. And then you've got this whole marketing tour and things, yes, are still that way, but they're not. The advancement in with Kindle and all of these different self-publishing opportunities and self-publishing houses, if you will, give people a chance to get there are things published and in, into the hands of even mainstream media long before something detrimental happens. It used to be you don't become a famous author until, you know, um, you pass on. But that's not the case anymore. Now you can have multiple books out there. You can have short books. You can have, uh, you know, these you can have novels. You can do a lot of things. You can turn your books into screenplay and all it. I mean, just with a click. And so really, I think it's very exciting what you've done because you took something that is a timeless classic from our childhood. Everybody knows the story. Mm -hmm. And most people now know the, the movie as well. My cousin Vinny. I mean, most people are really. Um, so merging these ideas and showing a creative side, I think that this is really exciting. I personally my, I am a very creative person and yeah. I just really love to, you know, have that, oh. it's, it's the adrenaline in these ideas that come, but this with you and then it's carrying on, you have how many books now? Um, I've written four. The uh, fourth one still needs the audio completing, which uh, should be around about early December. I just I need one more narrator to, to do his part. Mm -hmm. So, but that's in the process of being uh, uploaded to ACX. But 
I've got three audio books, four uh, e-books and paperbacks. But to be honest with you, uh, Rebecca, the paperbacks, they're not worth the money. The Kindle book is and the audio, the, the audio books are for me the best and probably they're not priced as much as they should be. Mm -hmm. that, that's really interesting you say that. And, and ironically, that's the way our world is right now. And I got to tell you, I, some, I just sometimes really miss having a book in my hand and smelling the paper and the print and all of those things. But in the same sense, I also kind of like the drive through and ETM version of being able to get my hands on something and, and dive into it super quick. So um, I don't know, but I, I can understand what you're saying. And I'm really excited about this. And I can't wait to hear a lot of the reviews that you're getting. Let's talk about your first book. And, and then I'd like to invite you to come back on so that we can, you know, just really hold each one in its own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Yes, uh, the first book then, uh, as I say, originally it was just for my own reference. It's something that I've achieved. But because I'd had so many views on the uh, on this particular site, it sparked me or impelled me to get the book finished. Oddly enough, before I finished the book, when I looked on, say, Amazon, other sites, somebody else had had the same title. So oh. somebody might, yeah, yeah. Somebody might have looked at the title and thought, well, that, that's a good idea. So before I finished mine, which took about four or five years, somebody uh, was quicker and uh, got the, that title. So there's going to be two. Not the same storyline. Sorry? Not the same storyline. Not no, your ideas. No. No. <laughs> you know, it's really funny that you mentioned that because oftentimes it, it, what it seems to amaze me is I'll come up with an idea for like the name of a website or a title of the next book that I have coming out and I will research it to make sure that nobody else has it. And I will yeah, be amazed yeah. at how many people do and th those things don't fall under copyright. And you can have a million, you know, ABC, whatever companies out there too with the same name. And yeah, yeah. Even you have to be really careful with that because of trademark and infringement and such. It still amazes me that you can be over here on the other side of the pond and I can have an idea. And we're in two different parts of the world. Yeah, we yeah. both go to Amazon and plug some a title in that we've had an idea for at the same time and or within a you know short period of time and i'm thinking how is that possible or even yeah, yeah. you think you have a unique name and you google <laughs> your name or you facebook your name and there's a million other people who already have that taken it just it, to me is mind-blowing how it's bizarre isn't it mm -hmm. it's bizarre it is. it is well i'm it's really bizarre. excited about this and i'm excited to get to know more about all of the things that you have going, this first book, without giving anything away, especially the plot, can you give a little snapshot maybe of like a comment or something that the big bad wolf says or something that would, you know, let the audience know, hey, I need to go check this out. Well, the um, the wolf is a wolf of Ball Street. I do a lot of play on words, right? So as a stock market trader, yeah? And is also a rapper, yeah. So, oh, hi. <laughs> you, you might find that on my second audio book, anyway, because uh, I wrote I wrote the song for it, but that's for another day. Yeah? And um, so, the it goes before the judge, and he's representing himself, he's defending himself, and the judge says about him being, he said, "Well, you are known as a big bad wolf." And he says, the only thing big about me is my nose. The only thing bad about me is my breath. And he said, well, wolves aren't, aren't known for the good reputation, are they? And he says, give a wolf a bad name and all wolves are bad. So that's a little bit of a snapshot. 
I love it. I love it. I am really delighted to hear the things that you have shared with us today. The just such pure heart that you have with helping other people. And I know that through this story, you are going to make a significant change in someone's life because of your creativity. They're going to have a different perspective on things. There's going to be something that will probably inspire them with ideas of their own. And that's what it's all about, Marco. Yeah. It's us yeah. really being able to help each other in one way or another. And I want to thank you so much. for. Absolutely. Yes, I'm so glad for you in everything that you're doing. And I'm really delighted that we got to spend some time just scratching the surface of getting to know you and the storyline. And I can't wait to see more. Where would a, a person that wants to get your book or connect with you and connect with you on social media, where should they go? Well, uh, I'm on YouTube. The um, It's MVD, Marco Van Dango, but there's a lot of numbers after it. So I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head. And uh, I'm at Marco Van Dango on TikTok. Okay, this is great because I'm starting to get these visuals and I can't wait. I know that the audience, those who are listening, those who are watching the show are all going to start thinking these things and then thinking in terms of this, the original storyline and how this is going to change and merge. And I'm really, really excited about that. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I'm honored. Thank you. Me too. I am so honored. And again, I, I can't wait. I mean, there's just so much. I'm so excited to have you on the show again. We're going to be talking about more. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to another episode of Rebecca Sounds Reveille. We ask that you share this with your friends, family, your loved ones, everybody you know, and everybody you don't. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>